Good morning and welcome to Mystery Monday. Today we are talking about a man named William Herons, William George Herons. He was born in 1928. He died in prison on March the 5th, 2012. He was an American convicted serial killer who confessed to three murders in 1946. He was called the Lipstick Killer after a notorious message scrawled in lipstick at a crime scene. At the time of his death, Herons was reputably, uh, reputably Chicago's longest serving prisoner, having spent 65 years in prison. Now, he was serving life sentence with the possibility of parole. He spent the later years of his sentence at Dixon Correctional Center in Dixon, Illinois. Though he had remained in prison until his death, he had recanted his confession and claimed to be a victim of coercive integration and police brutality. Charles Einstein wrote a novel called The Bloody Spur about Herons, published in 1953, which was adapted in the 1956 film called While the City Sleeps by Fritz Lang. So check that out. Now, on March the 5th of 2012, Herons died at the age of 83 at the UIC Medical Center from complications arising from his diabetes. Now, early in his life, he grew up in Lincolnwood, which was a suburb of Chicago, Illinois. He was the son of George and Margaret Herons. George was the son of immigrants from Luxembourg, and Margaret was a homemaker. Now, his family was poor, and his parents argued incessantly, uh, leading Herons to wander the streets to avoid listening to them. He took to crime and then later claimed that he mostly stole for fun and to release tension. He never sold anything that he had, that he had stolen. Now, at the age of 13, Herons was arrested for carrying a loaded gun. A subsequent search of his home discovered a, new, a number of stolen weapons hidden in an unusual storage shed on the roof of a nearby building, along with furs, suits, cameras, radios, and jewelry he had stolen. He admitted to 11 burglaries and was sent into the Gabalt School for Wayward Boys for several months. He was out again after his release. He was arrested again for theft and larceny. Now, this time, he was sentenced to three years at the St. Bidet Academy, operated by the Benediction Monks. Now, during his time in school, Heron stood out as an exceptional student, excelling in all subject areas, included but not limited to math, biological sciences, and social sciences. His test scores were so high, he was urged to apply for University of Chicago's Special Learning Program. He was accepted in the program just before his release, and asked to begin classes in the 1945 fall term, allowing him to bypass high school, and he was 16 years old. So, very, very smart man. Now, Herons returned home to live and commuted to the university, but this was impractical, and he eventually boarded at the university's Gates Hall. Now, his parents were unable to afford either the tuition or the boarding, so, of course, he worked several nights and evenings a week as an usher at the university as a docent to pay his way. However, he also resumed his serial burglaries even as he studied at the University of Chicago. Now, one of the graduates, Reva Berkovitz, which had his Ph.D. in 1948, he was part of the uh like I said, University of Chicago graduate, he reports that Herons was quite popular in the ballroom dance class that they had together. He said, I remember the most popular boy in my class who was handsome, smart, and a good dancer. We all wanted to dance with him, the foxtrot, the tango, or the waltz. It didn't matter. Now, there were three people who were murdered and that he was convicted of murdering. One was Josephine Ross, one was Francis Brown, and one was Susan Deegan. Now, Josephine Ross was 43 years old. She was uh, found dead in her apartment in 1945 in the North Kenmore Avenue in Chicago. She was repeatedly stabbed and her head was wrapped in a dress. She was presumed to have surprised an intruder uh, who then killed her. Uh, dark hairs were found clutched in her hand, indicating that she had struggled with the intruder before she was killed. No valuables at all were taken from the apartment, though. Ross's fiance had an alibi, as did her former boyfriend and ex-husband, and police had no other suspects. They looked for a dark-complected man who was reported loitering at the apartment or running from the scene, but were unable to identify or locate him. 
Now, Francis Brown was killed in 45 as well, but in December. So you've got Josephine Ross in June, and then you've got another one not too long after in December. Frances Brown was a divorced woman who was discovered with a knife lodged in her neck and a bullet wound to the head in her apartment, which is North Pine Grove Avenue in Chicago. Um, after a cleaning woman heard a radio playing loudly and noted that Brown's partly open door. Now, Brown had been savagely stabbed, and authorities thought that the burglar had been discovered or interrupted. No valuables were taken, but someone had written a message in lipstick on the wall of Brown's apartment. It said, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Now, police found a bloody fingerprint smudge on the door jam of the entrance door. Also, there was a possible witness of the killer's escape. An eyewitness, George Winberg, heard the gunshots at about 4 a.m. And according to John Derrick, the night clerk stationed in the lobby of the building, a nervous man of 35 or 40 years old and weighing approximately 140 pounds got off the elevator. He fumbled for the door to the street and he left. Four days after the murder, the Chicago police announced they had reason to believe the killer was a woman. This is where it gets even stranger. Now then, on January the 7th of 1946, six-year-old Suzanne Degnan was discovered missing from her first floor bedroom in Edgewater, Chicago. Police found a ladder outside the girl's window and a ransom note saying, get $20,000 ready and wait for word. Do not notify FBI or police. Bills in fives and tens, burn this for her safety. A man repeatedly called the Deegan residents demanding the ransom, but hung up before the meaningful conversation could take place. Uh, the Chicago mayor, Edward Kelly, also received a note. This is to tell you how sorry I am not to get old, which is sick, Deegan instead of his girl. Roosevelt and the OPA made their own laws. Why shouldn't I and a lot more? Now, at the time all this was going on, there was nationwide meatpacker strike and the Office of Price Administration, OPA, was talking of extending the rationing to dairy products. Now, Deegan was a senior OPA executive recently transferred to Chicago. Another executive was also recently assigned armed guards after receiving threats against his children in Chicago. A man involved with the black market meat had recently been murdered by decapitation. Police considered the possibility the digging killer was a meat packer. Now, police questioned hundreds of people, gave polygraph examinations to about 170, and several times claimed to have captured the killer, though they were all eventually released. There were several different people interviewed, and just none of it made sense. Uh, there was a man named Hector Verberg who was arrested. He was notably 65 years old. He was the janitor in the building where Deegan had lived and was arrested and taunted as a suspect. This is the man, despite discrepancies between Verberg's profile and the one that was developed by them of what kind of skills the killer had, including him having surgical knowledge of at least being a butcher. Police cited such evidence as Verberg frequented the so-called murder room and the grimy state of the ransom note suggested it was written by a dirty hand such as that of a janitor. The police pressured his wife to implicate her husband in the murder. Now, during this time, there was so much going on between the between all of the, the different um, I guess strikes going on during the time of the Depression. You just had so much going on. They were looking really dependent on anybody. Um, and they, like I said, they had several different people. They also had a man named Sidney Sherman. They investigated him. He was discharged Marine who had served in the World War II. Police had found blonde hairs in the back of Deegan's apartment building. Uh, nearby was a wire that authorities suspected could have been used. Um, also, a handkerchief the police suspected might have been used. Um, of course, the handkerchief was a laundry mark name. It had S. Sherman on it. The police hoped that perhaps the killer had aired it and leave him behind. Uh, he lived at Hyde Park at the, YW, the YMCA there. They questioned him. 
discovered that he had vacated the residence without checking out and quit his job without picking up the last paycheck. So, of course, a nationwide manhunt ensued. Sherman was found four days later in Toledo, Ohio. He explained under interrogation that he eloped with his girlfriend and denied that the handkerchief was his. He was administ administered a polygraph test. Of course, he passed, was later cleared. Uh, during all this time, the mystery phone calls were solved. And... They picked up a local boy named Theodore Campbell. Under questioning, he admitted that another local teenager named Vincent Costello had killed her, and the Tribune declared the Deegan case solved. Now, Costello lived only a few blocks from the Deegan apartment. Then, um, of course, he was convicted of a lot of armed robberies at age 16 and went to reform school. Uh, he said that he kidnapped and killed her and disposed of her body. Um, they think a lot of the stories started falling apart, though, because both of the men's polygraph tests indicated that they had no knowledge of this murder. They were just using whatever they had heard. They got another confession by another person named Richard Thomas, who was a nurse living in the Phoenix, Arizona area, who had moved from Chicago. He had been charged with multiple things. We won't go into detail on our page, but you can research that. Um, they checked his and saw great similarities between his handwriting and that of one of the ransom note, which the lipstick killer also left, and the ransom note for the money. Everything was kind of misspelled. Um, although he was living on the south side, he frequented a car yard directly across the street from where um, some of her body parts were found. During questioning, uh, he freely admitted to killing her. However, the authorities were intrigued by a, promise, a promising new suspect reported in the paper at the day, same day that the development broke out. A college student was caught fleeing from the scene of a burglary, brandished a gun at police, and possibly tried to kill one of the pursuing policemen to escape. By this time, Thomas had recanted to confession, um, but the press didn't notice the lightness of the lead. That's when they arrest and question Herons. He was 17 years old, was arrested on attempted burglary charges when a neighbor saw him breaking into an apartment. And Herons allegedly pointed the gun he was carrying at the men, saying, let me get out or I'll let you have, the, have it in your guts. Now, the janitor of the neighbor seized their pursuit, uh, made his way to a building to lie low, but a resident spotted him, called the police. Uh, he escaped down the staircase. They closed in on him. They trapped him. Um, so, uh, he did pull the trigger. The gun misfired. In the police accounts, Heron charged them after his gun misfired twice. A scuffle result resulted. They tried to put him in to a, um, basically a psychiatrist interviewed him. They tried to put him on sodium pentothal without a warrant and without his parents' consent. They interrogated him. They said under the influence of the drug, authorities claimed that he spoke of an alternate personality named George who had actually committed all the murders, claimed that he recalled little of the drug-induced interrogation, that when police asked for George's last name, he could not remember, and that he was, mur he was a murmuring name. Police stated that this to Merman, and the media lately dramatized it into Murder Man, which Herons actually said is in dispute. Uh, and, of course, the original transcript disappeared. Um, there was just so much. The cops were so willing, I think, at this time to um, identify somebody as the murderer that they pinned this on him. I don't necessarily know that he actually did this because all he's ever known for through this whole time was burglary and he never sold anything that he kept he kept it all and there had never been any reason excuse me for him to hurt anybody there had never been any records of him hurting anybody everybody thought he was this lovable wonderful guy and he was very smart um he just did these things to get away from his family and to try to pass the time now that doesn't make it right but he he cooperated uh, with the police uh, and they had an
They administered the polygraph test, including the state's attorney, announced that the results were inconclusive. He was transferred to Cook County Jail, where he was placed in the infirmary to recover from uh, feeling bad and having a lumbar puncture uh, without anesthesia. Uh, after the sodium pentanol questioning, but before the polygraph exam, he spoke to a Captain Michael Aaron and claimed that while under there, he gave his indirect confession and they came up empty handed, but said that he met George when he was 13 years old, which George sent him prowling out at night and that he robbed for pleasure and killed like a cobra when cornered. George related his secrets to Herons. Heron allegedly claimed that he was always taking the rap for George for the petty theft, then assault, and now murder. Psychologists explained at the time, in the same way children make up imaginary friends, Heron made up this personality to keep his antisocial feelings and actions separate from the person who could be the average son and student, date nice girls, and go to church. Now, it is very possible he had an alternate personality. That is very, very possible um, because that does happen when people are put in strange situations and, and horrible situations. And that very well could be that he just didn't recall or remember anything. But... Let's see. While the handwriting analysis did not definitely link Heron's handwriting to the lipstick message, police claimed that his fingerprints matched the print discovered at the scene of one of the crimes on the door jam. He had nine points out of 12 points for comparison of the loops when they did the fingerprint analysis. Uh, this could also provide a match of 65% of the population. And at the time, though, the supporters pointed out the FBI handbook regarding the fingerprint identification required 12 points. But, of course, they did not uh, check that. On 1946, Captain Emmett Evans told newspapers that Herons had been cleared of the suspicion in the Brown murder as the fingerprint left in the apartment was not his. Twelve days later, Chief of Detectives Walter Storms confirmed that the bloody smudge left on the door jam was Herons. So, I don't know. I mean, it's it's just there's a lot of things that are kind of iffy with all that. The police did a lot of searches on his residence and his dorm without a warrant. Uh, they noticeably recovered a scrapbook containing pictures of Nazi officials that belonged to a war veteran. Um, he had burgled the place uh, the night of Susan. Deegan was killed. Lived close by, but they wasn't in the same apartment complex. It was just the vicinity, so they tried to put him in together. Um, I don't know. It just, I don't know. Let's see. They also found in his belongings, discovered a stolen medical kit that they announced that the medical instruments could not be linked to the murders. No trace of biological materials. Medical kit tools were considered to be too fine and too small for the dissection. So basically, they also found some war bonds he had stolen. A gun was found in the possession that was linked to a shooting, but not that particular one. There was a lot of press influence. They were calling him a Dr. Jekyll, kind of Mr. Clyde personality. They, of course, put radio newscasts reporting the Chicago Tribune scoop of the confessions. He said, I didn't confess to anybody. Honestly, my God, why are they going to pin on, what are they going to pin on me next? So he constantly said that he wasn't guilty, but then later Rickanis said he was guilty because he'd rather go to prison than to be serving on death row and be killed. He had a better chance in prison, he said. Well, he took responsibility in August of 1946, like I said. They had him say he was guilty and admit on burglary and murder charges. He tried to hang himself in his cell. 
which was around the time of shift changing of the prison guards. And he even said, everybody believed I was guilty. If I weren't alive, I felt I could avoid being a judge guilty by the law and therefore gain some kind of victory, but I wasn't successful even at that. He said, before I walked in the courtroom, my counsel told me to just enter a plea of guilty and keep my mouth shut afterwards. He said, I didn't even have a trial. And then he said on September the 5th, after further evidence was written into record and prosecution defense and made closing arguments, Herons waited to be transferred to the Stateville Prison from Cook County Jail, and they asked Herons if, if the Susan Dignan woman suffered, and he said, I can't tell you if she suffered. Sheriff, I didn't kill her. Tell Mr. Deegan to please look after his other daughter because whoever killed Susan's still out there. He still, within days of dying, he still said that he didn't do it. And even the even the even one of the um, siblings, one of the, the daughter, Mary Jane Blanchard, the daughter of the murder victim, Joseph Ross, she said, I cannot believe that young Herons murdered my mother. He just does not fit into the picture of my mother's death. I have looked at all the things he stole, and there was nothing of my mother's things among them. So, I mean, it's just time after time after time. Things just didn't really add up, and I think he was wrongfully accused. But at that time, some of their stuff, they just didn't have enough evidence for things. Later, um, William Herrings died. This is what he looked like when he was in prison before he died. Uh, after being taken to the University of Illinois Medical Center on February 26th, 2012, he, uh, due to complications, he had diabetes. And uh, Harris died on March the 5th, 2012, at the age of 83. Um, you can find lots of information on the lipstick killer. Um, there's lots of references, you know, lipstick killer behind bars. CNN did an area on it. Uh, you know, Kennedy, uh, Dolores Kennedy did a Bill Aarons ask for help so he won't die in prison uh, in 2007. Uh, I mean, they even had a man named Richard Thomas come forth and actually confess uh, and give spots on details of the crime, which was ignored by the police and let go free. Uh, I mean, they even beat him for confessions at this time. There was also William Aaron's dead, known as the Lipstick Killer. It was written in the Chicago Tribune by William Lee. I mean, you've got um, articles written saying the monster that Terrorized Chicago, and you, Aaron's linked to murder of Wave by print. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of information you can find and research on him. I really just think that he was just, because of him stealing and everything, was put down for it. And it really wasn't even something that he did. But he is known as, and goes down in history as the lipstick killer. So, think about it. Um, see what you think. You can also check out Crime Podcast. Um, there's CrimeJunkie.com. You can listen to Ashley as she tells about the infamous lipstick killer. She gives story of it. You can also find story on a lot of other pages as well about it. Um, just do your research and find out. But I just thought this one was really interesting. The Lipstick Killer. Till next time. Catch you on next Mystery Monday.